Hi, I'm Trent Gray Donald. I'm a distinguished engineer with IBM in our data and AI division. I'm here to talk to you today about accelerating your Azure data and AI journey uh, with IBM's Data Fabric. IBM's got a long and storied history around data management, data integration, data governance. And, and what we've done is we've taken our uh, capabilities and brought them to another great uh, company in the space, Microsoft and the Azure platform. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to show you how we've partnered together to really unlock uh, everything you can around your Azure native data sources and tools, as well as getting additional benefits from IBM's capabilities. So let's start by talking about the complexities that most companies face today. Today, the reality is that every company has many different data sources, many different data processors, and this frankly ends up being a logistical nightmare, both for people trying to consume it and finding the right data, but also those running it because they need to secure it. They need to make sure there's the appropriate lineage, governance, compliance, and we need to make sure that people are doing this well. Now, what customers have tried in the past is go to one single centralized data store that, that solves all the problems. And this has effectively universally failed spectacularly. It's just simply not possible. The number of use cases, the rate and pace at which data is changing makes it almost impossible for these centralized systems to keep going. And frankly, you've got data on-prem, on, and not just on one cloud, on multiple clouds. Some of them are the hyperscalers like uh, Azure, but others may be in vendor specific ones like Salesforce. We have this significant complexity to deal with. So what's the answer? The new approach is really something called a data fabric. And what this allows you to do is abstract and focus on allowing multiple data sources and carefully balancing your use of virtualization and materialization as appropriate in your scenarios. It helps people do the governance aspects and keeps compliance in line. So what it allows you to do is get much closer to a self-serve use for all of your different users. So there's really a dual benefit in approaching from a data fabric perspective. There's really the technical teams and the CTOs who are really worried about how to get the right data available to their users. How do I make sure the quality is good? How do I make sure that my infrastructure costs are low? Uh, how do I help people access the data? There's, there's nothing worse than having a six month backlog in data requests to a system where the, the central team is working as fast as it can and simply can't produce the, the, data, the operational data stores that people need. Then the other side is the data consumers. And in this, in this age of needing to move faster, I want this data now. How do we do that? And so the data fabric provides people the ability to find the right data using the right terms that they expect. So business terms, not highly technical terms around database table names, and it really lets them work with the data instead of having to spend forever fighting to get access to the data. It's also a benefit to the compliance officers and data officers where they're worried about the wrong people getting access to the wrong data. And so a data fabric has this ability to specify rules that can be enforced and also gathers lineage and audit records as they go. Let's jump now to the demo. IBM's data fabric is manifested through Cloud Pack for Data. And what we've done is we've stood up an instance of Cloud Pack for Data natively on the Azure platform. So what you see here is running in Azure and is accessible through the marketplace. So in this demo, we brought up the home page for Cloud Pack for Data, which is the home for our data fabric. And we see it organized into multiple different areas. We've designed the whole experience around people in different roles collaborating. We have what we call projects, which is where people do productive work. We have catalogs, which is where people either find data and other assets like AI models, or they publish the results of what they've done. And finally, what we also have is deployment spaces, which is where people will deploy the work that they have done. So if they have built an ETL flow, 
they will deploy it to a deployment space for execution in production, or the same thing with the machine learning model or what have you. So let's drill in here. One of the cornerstones of Cloud Pack for Data is operating with data. So let's go here and let's go and look at platform connections. The key thing about any data platform is that it has the ability to reach data in any number of different places. So what we see here is we see there's several data stores that I've already set up here. So for instance, I've got a DB2 on IBM Cloud, but then I also have a connection to an Azure Data Lake, which is using ADLS. I also have an Azure SQL database, and we also have an Atiza performance server, which is running on Azure infrastructure as well, which is now a service from IBM. Now, what we see is it's not just a small number of sources. What we have is we have a very large number of connectors. So what we see is the Microsoft family. We also see all sorts of important cases like SAP, Snowflake, Salesforce, uh, Cloudera, et cetera. Uh, so we have a large list of different data sources that we can connect to as part of the platform. So while you may be hosted on Azure, you may need to reach different data sources elsewhere, and we have you covered for that. The first thing I want to do is I want to show you uh, an Azure data integration scenario. It's a very simple one, but what we see is in our projects, we have things lined up by data assets and then different kinds of assets. So in this case, we have a data stage flow. And so this is a very simple one. This is basically reading from an OLTP database and writing the results to an ADLS data lake. So very, very simple and integrated nicely with the platform. So this is what's called the Data Stage Studio. A lot of connectors, right? We can see all sorts of different connectors through here, including the whole Microsoft family. And it's easy just to drag them on and then we just edit the properties for them. And in this case, we're just going from the customer transaction database into the Azure data lake. And we can just click on it here. What we see is right to a CSV. We can do Avro, right, Parquet, a whole bunch of different formats and be stored in that ADLS world. If we clicked run, it would just go off and do that run. We can schedule that, make that a job. Now we're going to show you IBM's auto AI system, which allows you to build machine learning models uh, very quickly and easily and helps accelerate your data science journey. We have a whole world built up around machine learning as well. And in our machine learning, we have some very powerful tools available to us. So what we see is we have a powerful capability that allows data scientists to accelerate their life. What we're gonna do today is we're gonna use a simple data set based on the Titanic manifest and we're going to go and predict how well people have done in surviving. So what we do is we do a simple thing here where we look at some data assets. We look at the Titanic. We see that there's 12 columns and uh, this is not a time series forecast. And we go and predict. And what it's doing is it's spinning up a pod. Now, these are running in OpenShift on Azure infrastructure. So this is all possible to, to run natively on Azure so that you're close to your data and close to your ADLS and Azure SQL universe. So what it's doing now is it's taking the data set and it's splitting the different parts out. So there's a holdout component and a training data set, and now it's pre-processing, and now it's going through and it's actually building models. So it went through and did a bunch of data prep to figure stuff out. And now it's selecting the different algorithms. So it's going through and trying to determine what different pipelines make sense. And what it's going to do is it's going to try to run about seven or eight different pipelines. And it's learning as it goes to see what kinds of information it can find. Now what we see is we see that eight different pipelines have been produced. And it's decided that Pipeline four is the winner here. And what we can do is we can save that either as a model or as a notebook. And then we can work on those and use that as the basis for working from that point on. 
we're now going to go into a notebook where we are going to take the output of the auto AI model and we're going to deploy this onto AKS using the Azure ML universe. So this is the notebook that has been produced by auto AI. It allows us to run the model. Now, the new part here that we've added at the bottom, and we have a blog entry about this, after we've built the model, we're actually going to use Azure ML to deploy into an AKS cluster for use as online scoring. So this allows you to use the best of IBM along with the Microsoft native services like Azure ML and AKS. And what we see is we have this ability to connect to the Azure ML universe. Then we register the model. So this is all pretty standard stuff in, in the Azure ML universe. And then we create the environment. And then there's a script that basically happens to do the run. Then we create the inference config. We create the cluster. So this is the uh, cluster being built inside our account, inside our Azure ML universe. And then we deploy the web service and we can see how it has created the resources. It's deployed it. We then choose some values. We do the scoring. So we decide there's one person in first class, one person in third class. We run the prediction, it comes back that one of them survived and the other did not. We can do the same thing through HTTP. So what I've just done is I've shown you how to build a model very easily from nothing more than a CSV. And then what we've done is in a few simple cells, we have taken that model, we've deployed it onto AKS using Azure ML. So this is a powerful capability that allows you to use the best in class IBM machine learning training building creation universe along with robust Azure ML deployment capabilities. What I'd like to show you next is IBM's best in class AI governance and management system, IBM Watson OpenScale. It's part of Cloudback for Data again and part of our data fabric solution. So let's dig in. What we've done is we've deployed a couple of machine learning models into the Azure ML universe. So we're using the IBM tool on top of the standard Microsoft Azure ML. So you don't have to rebase your machine learning universe. So let's drill in here. So this is the German credit risk situation. It's run a number of different tests. And what we're seeing is there's a number of alerts and we can drill into that. And what we can see is that there are some problems that are being highlighted. It's important with predictions that we're able to explain why a given prediction happened. This is again our Titanic model that was built by Auto AI. What I can do is I can go through and choose a, a given transaction and click on explain. And what it does is it goes through and it tries to give an English sentence describing why the result was what it was. It looked and it determined that the biggest reasons why the result happened were because of passenger class. So first class passenger and the, the person was young. And then the main contributor saying that they would not survive was because they were male instead of female. So what we see is a very simple, easy way of reading this Next, I'd like to show a couple of the governance capabilities of the platform. What I've done is I have created a catalog and into it, I have placed some data assets. And what I have here is I have a data set that I have produced that has a number of different characteristics. And one of the ones that I want to talk about today is email. So we see there's a column called email and what we see is as part of cataloging, we run automatic classification and I have not done anything here. This has actually been classified and it determined that these were last names and first names. And so what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna show you some rules. This is one of the most powerful capabilities in our system. We can set up rules 
and let's say that we, we don't want people to see email addresses. So I've created a rule that's basically called obfuscate emails. And then if something contains an email address, then we have a rule saying mask the data and it's going to obfuscate it. So we now have a rule in our system and you'll say, but, but Trent, I just saw the email addresses. Well, it's because I'm the owner. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch over to a different user. What we see here is welcome admin. We have a different user. It's Trent, not admin. And what I do is I go into my catalogs and I'm going to choose the personal data field as well. And then I go and choose the asset. And I see it's different already. First, I see one column masked and I see a lock. And so what's happening is that the data masking is being obfuscated and it shows, oh, I've fallen afoul of the emails rule. We can go and look at the profile and we see all sorts of interesting information. But what we see when we get to email is there's a lock symbol. It says the column's been anonymized and you can't see the profile because it's masked. What I would like to show you now is policy enforcement as done in notebooks in real time. What we have is we have two data sets here. We have some customer data in the US and customer data in the EU. So what we have is the customer data in the EU. And we notice that two things have been added to the universe. First, the location of the data set, and it has a sovereignty of being in the European Union. And we can see that the US data is in the US uh, with the sovereignty of the United States. Now, what we're gonna do is we have, let's go back to our rules universe. And in this instance, we have some special new rules and they're what are called data location rules. This location one is more sophisticated because it has conditions like if the source sovereignty was European Union and the target is in the US, then you need to redact some extra columns. So what we can do is we can see that uh, live in action in a notebook. I'm now gonna show you a feature that is not in the GA product yet, but is working in our lab. So this is a sneak peek. This may change before it goes to final production, but we wanna show you the capabilities right now. Okay, what we have is we have a notebook that is showing the power of our location-based policy work, and it's combining with a system that uh, we're working in the open source, so there's a project called Fibric, F-Y-B-R-I-K. And it helps coordinate access to data and brokers through to decision-making systems. We're bringing in the, the Fabric SDK. This is the productized version of uh, Fibric itself. And what it's doing is it's, it's creating an application that we will be able to add data to and then query. So what we've got is we have our app and we've created an asset. So what it's saying is that the first asset ID is uh, the Americas data and the second ID is the European data. We believe strongly in the Apache Arrow flight protocol. And so what we've done, and it's actually a great fit for Python notebooks, is we have flight servers that will serve up the appropriate data. So what this is doing is the, the underlying data is in a Postgres database in, the, uh, in this case in the US. And what we've done is we've gone to the flight server, the flight server has turned around and asked the Postgres database for the data and it came back. But the interesting thing is that our flight server is policy aware and it said, aha, there's a rule you're not allowed to see the credit limit. So what we see is the credit limit has been masked. Now, the second one is because the database is in Europe and I'm currently in North America, we expect to see other things happening here. What we see is that more columns are masked. Policy has been applied dynamically. There was no ETL job. There was no other magic involved here. Our data fabric systems filtered it dynamically during the query. 
So that shows the power that we can use and we can build these things out of notebooks at any time. All right, and that's our demo. What you saw here was a combination of IBM and Microsoft tools working better together. And so just to recap, what I started by showing you was the wide variety of data sources that Cloud Pack for Data can consume, including all the important ones, both from Microsoft and others on the Azure platform. We then moved on to some data movement and showed how easy it is to basically do the data movement. Then we moved into uh, an AI space where we again took advantage of both IBM technology to build models quickly and then deployed them using Microsoft native services such as Azure ML and AKS. Then finally, what I did is I gave you a tour of the governance capabilities and the rules and the enforcement capabilities of our platform, allowing people uh, to write better rules and safely control their data. If you'd like to know more, I recommend looking at this link to see Cloud Pack for Data on the Azure Marketplace, or this link to see the overall IBM data fabric story. Thank you very much for your time.